Good morning. The committee of one. That this is that time of year that everybody's busy, and I think it's something when they start to hear my voice, they start to adjourn their caucus meetings. It's the hour of convening has arrived, and the Senate will come to order. Ask that all unauthorized persons exit the chamber, which I see a mad rush for the door. Door. Chair to like to recognize his good friend, the very timely senator from the 53rd. Thank you, Mr. President. I've learned punching, uh, being here on time by following. I like that first word. What was the first I word you were trying get to say? I couldn't get it out. I'm, I'm, I refuse to do it again. Punctuality. Is that it? Okay. Anyway, I feel like the Maytag repairman today, except for the two that have recently joined me. I want to tell you a moment in time, a great man, a good uh, athlete and actor, Jim Brown was born in St. Simons Island in 1936. He attended Syracuse University, played five sports, was drafted into the NFL, who, and then played for the Cleveland Browns. He was elected both to the college and the professional football hall of fames. And uh, he's just a real neat guy. Most people don't know that he was from St. Simons. Today's National Cabbage Day and also Ash Wednesday for our Catholic friends. Mr. President, the journal's been read and found to be correct. You were unusually insightful today. Is there objection to dispensing with the reading of the journal? Chair hears none, and the reading of the journal is dispensed with. Is there objection to the confirmation of the journal? Chair hears none, and the journal is confirmed. All senators who have bills and resolutions, please bring them to the secretary's desk at this time. Mr. Secretary, first reading of Senate bills and resolutions, please. Senate Bill 182 by Senator Robertson of the 29th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 60 of Title 36 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to general provisions applicable to counties and municipal corporations. So State and local government in general. Senate Bill 183 by Senator Robertson of the 29th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 1 of Chapter 16 of Title 15 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to general provisions regarding sheriffs so as to revise Public safety. Senate Bill 184 by Senator Calzard of the 46th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 2 of Title 21 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to elections and primaries generally so as to revise the time for inputting credit Ethics. for voting data. Senate Bill 185 by Senator Hatchett of the 50th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 2 of Title 48 of the OCGA relating to state administrative organization, administration, and enforcement Judiciary. of revenue. Judiciary. Senate Bill 186 by Senator Parent of the 42nd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 1 of Title 28 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to general provisions regarding the General Assembly so as to provide certain procedures for redistricting of the General Assembly and congressional Reapportionment districts. and redistricting. Senate Bill 187 by Senator Tippins of the 37th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Code Section 20-3-519.2 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to eligibility requirements for a HOPE scholarship so as to establish... Higher education. Senate Bill 188 by Senator Calzard of the 46th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 2 of Title 21 of the o Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to elections and primaries generally so as to provide for an election results reporting system to be established Ethics. and maintained. Senate Bill 189 by Senator Calzard of the 46th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Title IX of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to civil practice so as to provide for separate trials for issues of liability and damages. Judiciary. Senate Bill 190 by Senator Calzard of the 46th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 51 of the OCGA, relating to torts so as to provide for the recovery and admissibility of special damages for medical and health care expenses to provide for related Judiciary. matters. Judiciary. Senate Bill 191 by Senator Calzard of the 46th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 40 of the OCGA relating to motor vehicles and traffic so as to change certain provisions relating to insurance of motor carriers and... Insurance and labor. Senate Bill 192 by Senator Anna Vitarte of the 31st, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 2 of Title 21 of the OCGA relating to elections and primaries generally so as to provide for hearings and procedures when the right of a person to... Ethics. Senate Bill 193 by Senator Mullis of the 53rd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 5 of Title 48 of the OCGA relating to ad valorem taxation of property so as to grant counties the option Finance. of requiring. Senate Bill 194 by Senator Mullis of the 53rd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Code Section 16-8-12 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to penalties for theft and violation of Code Section. Judiciary. 
Senate Bill 195 by Senator Mullis of the 53rd, a bill to be entitled an act to amend code section 2-23-3 of the OCGA relating to definitions regarding hemp farming so as to revise a definition to provide for related matters. Agriculture and consumer affairs. Senate Bill 196 by Senator Jackson of the 2nd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend chapter 6 of title 16 of article 1 of chapter 10 of title 17, article 2 of chapter 3rd, of Title 35, Title 42, and Article 1 of Chapter 2 of Title 49 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to sexual offenses, procedure for sentencing, and imposition of punishment. Judiciary. Senate Bill 197 by Senator Jackson of the 41st and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 7 of Chapter 5 of Title 16 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated, relating to stalking so as to revise the definition of Judiciary. Place. Senate Bill 198 by Senator Harper of the 7th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 2 of Title 35 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to the Department of Public Safety so as to provide for substances. Public Safety. And Senate Resolution 109 by Senator Harrell of the 40th and others, a resolution expressing support for employees of the University System of Georgia and for other Appropriations. purposes. Appropriations. Senate Resolution 112 by Senator Mullis of the 53rd and others, a resolution honoring the life and memory of Sergeant Henry Jean Mullis and dedicating an intersection in his memory and for other purposes. Transportation. That, that completes the order, Mr. President. First reading of House bills and resolutions, please. House Bill 93. 93 by Representative Cooper of the 43rd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 31 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to health so as to eliminate duplicative state licensure and regulation Health of and Human Services. House Bill 128 by Representatives Williams of the 145th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 1 of Title 31 of the OCGA relating to general provisions regarding health so as to prohibit providers from health discriminating. Health and Human Services. House Bill 146 by Representative Gaines of the 117th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 1 of Chapter 20 of Title 45 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to general provisions regarding personnel administration so as to provide for paid Insurance parental and leave. labor. House Bill 163 by Representative Cooper of the 43rd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend the Article 7 of Chapter 4 of Title 49 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to medical assistance generally so as to direct the Department Health of Health and Community. Human Services. House Bill 200 by Representative Powell of the 32nd, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 40 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to motor vehicles and traffic so as to provide for the issuance of Class C driver's licenses to operators of certain three-wheeled motor vehicles to exempt operators of third- Public safety. House Bill 207 by Representatives Corbett of the 174th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 40 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to motor vehicles and traffic so as to provide Public for- Public safety. House Bill 254 by Representative Lumsden of the 12th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 1 of Chapter 23 of Title 33 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to licensing of agents, agencies, subagents, counselors, and adjusters so as Insurance to increase- Insurance and labor. House Bill 331 by Representative Frazier of the 126th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to provide a new charter for the city of Sardis to provide for incorporation, boundaries, and powers of the city to provide for related matters, to repeal specific act, to repeal conflicting laws- State and local government. House Bill 357 by Representative Campbell of this 171st, a bill to be entitled an act to amend an act to provide a new charter for the city of Pelham, approved April 28, 2016, to reduce the size of the city council. State and local government. House Bill 361 by Representative Green of the 151st and others, a bill to be entitled an act to provide a new charter for the city of Edison, to provide State for definitions. State and local government. House Bill 375 by Representative Smith of the 18th, a bill to be entitled an act to authorize by the governing authority of the city of Bremen to levy an excise tax pursuant to subsection B of code section 48-13-51. State and local government. House Bill 376 by Representative Laricchia of the 169th, a bill to be entitled an act to amend an act to reconstitute the Board of Education of Bacon County, approved February 20th, 1976. State and local government. That completes the order, Mr. President. Secretary will now read reports of standing committees. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Government Oversight has under, had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Resolution 28, do pass. Senate Resolution 29, do pass. Senate Bill 100, do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Harbin of the, the 16th District Chair. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Insurance and Labor has 
under consideration under the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 82, do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Burke of the 11th District Chair. That completes the order, Mr. President. All right, it's now time for our morning roll call. It is now time for morning roll call. Are there any motions to excuse? The chair recognizes the senator from the 33rd. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, y'all. I'd like for unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the 35th, the 36th, the 38th, and that's it, sir. Thank you. Without objection, the senators from the 35th, 36th, and 38th are excused. Chair recognizes the senator from the 21st. Uh, yes, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the 25th and the 27th for business outside the Capitol. Was the second one the 27th? 27th, yes, sir. Without objection, the senators from the 25th and the 27th are excused. Are there any additional motions to excuse? The chair sees none. The secretary will call the roll of senators. Signify your presence by voting the yay switch. The secretary will unlock the machine. All right, Mr. Secretary, please close the machine. It's now time for a morning devotional, and I ask that all senators take your seats and cease all audible conversations, which you're way ahead of schedule. Doorkeepers, please secure the chamber. I'd like to recognize the pro tem to lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance and to introduce to us our chaplain of the day. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Georgia flag. Pledge allegiance to the Georgia flag and the principles for which it stands, wisdom, justice, and moderation. Thank you, Mr. President. It gives me great pleasure to introduce a longtime friend of mine, a, a gentleman who has distinguished himself here at the Capitol on many occasions. He is a, a, an author. He is a uh, devout follower of Jesus Christ. He is an individual who has opened the United States House of Representatives. He has opened the uh, United States Senate. He has been pastor of the day here in this body. He's been pastor of the day across the hall in the house. Uh, he is married to Renee, and they have three children, Tiffany, Alexis, and George IV. He goes by Stuart. One distinction of, uh, of our pastor today is that he can trace his family back to pre-revolutionary war. In my 
lifetime. I've only known of three, and this would be the fourth family that could do that. The senator from, uh, from Lumpkin County uh, can trace his family back to pre-revolutionary war. I imagine the senator from the eighth can trace his family back to pre-revolutionary war. Uh, Dr. Lewis in Madison County and uh, Morgan County rather and uh, and the Gerards in Lumpkin County only families I know that can trace their family roots that far back uh, he is an individual that uh, has distinguished himself on the basketball court and in the pulpit he is a, a great friend of mine and if you have the opportunity to come down and say hello uh, to Pastor George Re George Dillard I would encourage you to because you will enjoy getting to know him. Please give a, uh, your attention to uh, Pastor George as he brings our morning devotion. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to be here. It's, uh, it's good to see all of you, and uh, I hope... Uh, I hope that you can say it was good to see me when we get done. You know, um, I grew up here in this state. Uh, my dad was born in a house that is not far from this building, 814 Edgewood Avenue. It's still standing. Uh, we moved to Fairburn in the 1960s. My dad took over a hardware store there. And uh, tell you about the about the Georgia that I grew up in, in the in the home that I grew up in. Every Thanksgiving and Christmas, my dad would uh, buy fifty half bushel baskets. He at Thanksgiving he would put a frozen turkey in them, and canned goods and fresh fruit. And at Christmas, a ham canned goods and fresh fruit. We would take them to 50 needy families in our area and uh, knock, just put them on the porch, knock on the door and run. Uh, and that was, it was great fun for my brothers and I. I have three younger brothers. And uh, we did that as long as my dad till, till his stroke in 1997. But uh, that's the, that's the kind of uh, home that I grew up in and, and the kind of Georgia that I grew up in. And I was thinking about that just, just recently. Um, reminded me of a passage of Scripture in Galatians chapter 6. And, and what the Apostle Paul tells the church through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is... Uh, do not grow weary in doing what is good. And, you know, I, I thought about that because my dad, even though he did that, he was also one that would say there's no good deed that will go unpunished. And sometimes I think that we are a little hesitant to do good because we're afraid of the way that people will react. But Galatians 6 reminds us that if we continue to do what is good, that at the proper time, the harvest will come in and it'll be the harvest that we want. You know, there's another place in Scripture that says, He has shown you what is good. And what the Lord requires of you to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk in humility. And so I want to encourage you as the men and women who have been selected by the citizens of the great state of Georgia to come to this body and this assembly to do good, regardless of what is out there regardless of what people say just do good don't grow weary i know i know that sometimes it seems like no good deed goes unpunished but that should not stop us 
That should not stop us from doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God. Would you join me this morning in a word of prayer? Father, we honor you because you are the great and mighty God, the everlasting Father, the great I Am, the one who spoke all things into existence and the one who holds all things together by the power of your hand. And Father, I pray for the men and women of this Senate. I pray wisdom. I pray understanding knowledge and discernment i pray father for strength and courage to do what is good to love justice to love mercy and to walk humbly with you bless them strengthen them and help us always to love you and your son and his appearing and it's in jesus name that i pray Amen.
Ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, we have a distinguished guest with us this morning. We'd like for uh, you to give him your attention and he would share some, uh, some thoughts and ideas that, or maybe experiences from, uh, from our U.S. Capitol, uh, represent United States Representative Earl Buddy Carter from District 1 is with us. Give him a warm Senate welcome. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pro Tem. It is so good to be back home. I cannot tell you how good, for a number of reasons, not the least of which it's good to be out of the asylum, excuse me, out of Washington, D.C., and it's good to be here. And I want to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for the outstanding work that you're doing on behalf of the citizens of the state of Georgia. In the first congressional district of Georgia, we have sent you three new members up here to the state senate that we're very proud of. My good friend Billy Hickman, who is representing South Effingham County in the first district. Sheila McNeil, who represents Camden, Glen, and part of McIntosh County and other areas in the first congressional district. And also my good friend and a great American, Russ Goodman, representing Clinch County and other areas. So we've done our job in sending you some fine new members and and hopefully you'll take good care of them, and I know you will. Again, I want to thank you for all you do in Congress. I have the honor and privilege of serving on the Energy and Commerce Committee, and this year I've been appointed to the Communications and Technology Subcommittee. Rural broadband is certainly something that we are working on in a federal level. I know you are working on it at a state level. It is extremely important, has been amplified during this pandemic, and knowing how important telehealth is and knowing how important making sure that we have students have access to high-speed internet and to broadband is very important as well. We'll continue to do our work at the federal level, and I hope you will continue to do your work at the state level. Again, thank you for all you do for the citizens of Georgia. It's a pleasure to be with you today. God bless you. Very much. Are there any unanimous consents? Does any senator wish to rise on a point of personal privilege? I recognize the senator from the fourth. Good morning, senators. Um, I would like to recognize a great uh, American from my, from my county, Bullock County. Uh, he, like uh, Coach Ur Ur Russell said, he was not born in Bullock County, but it didn't, it didn't take him long to get there. He's a great person, a great teacher, and a great leader. And I'm speaking of a gentleman by the name of Dr. Charles Bond. Dr. Bonds taught in Wrens and Valdosta from 1990, 1966 to 1972, moved to Statesboro, and became the first black professor of Georgia Southern University in 1973, retired in 1996 as full professor emeritus, becoming the first black professor to earn full professorship in 1991. Gained notoriety as a reading professor by giving reading buddies stuffed animals to children as he read wearing full academic regalia. And in 2009, he penned, sang, and produced his own Christmas Carol CD all while he was blind. Unbelievable individual, Dr. Bond. Dr. Bonds, doctor in education, he resides in Statesboro with his wife of 52 years, Dr. Leah Theresa Gant Bonds, and says that he never would have accomplished anything if not for her. Their son is Charles Wesley Bonds and a granddaughter, Theresa Bonds. Dr. Bonds is definitely no stranger in Bullock County. In 1981, he taught reading for G Georgia Southern Upward Bound Program. In 1994, he was duly honored for what Randy Gunner, director, calls a commitment educational excellence. Today, hundreds of successful students still sing his praises. 
my personal connection to Dr. Bonds and my wife's personal connection, Joanne, is that when she went back and got her uh, education degree from Georgia Southern, Dr. Bonds was her most favorite professor. And still, when we called and talked to him the other night about uh, doing this in his honor, he remembered her, which was pretty Im Im important. Unbelievable, Bonds, a native of Headland, Alabama, comes from a family of 20 children, 10 boys and 10 girls. He was number five. His father, C.W. Bonds, was owner of a garage, prophetically nicknamed him Head due to his intelligence. Since young Bonds read all the manuals aloud to him, he was the first one on his father's side to finish high school and college and earn a doctorate. When asked what she remembers about her son, his mother, now 93 years old, says that he always had his head stuck in a book or was helping uh, Miss Hilbreth, his high school librarian, catalog books. In fact, knowing the Dewey Decimal System procured him a needed college work and a study job as a library assistant. After high school, Dr. Bonds headed off to Alabama State University with a suitcase empty of clothes but full of hope. There he earned a BS in elementary education with a minor in social science. Later he earned his specialist degree in 1972 and in 19, 1990, 1990, 1974, excuse me, in reading education from Georgia Southern. Then he headed down to the University of Florida on a stipend from Georgia Southern where he obtained his doctorate in reading in 1978. Dr. Bonds headed up programs while at Georgia Southern. In 1972 and 73, he was the fairly funded Right to Read project. From 1973 to 78, he was the Learning Analysis Center as coordinator. He was also the advisor for the Black Student Alliance, the, a the AAC Club and Choir, and the Good News Bible Study. In addition, he founded the National Honor Society in Reading Education, which is affiliated with the International Reading Association. In 1994, he received a well-deserved University Service Award. Dr. Bonds has offered three books, the last two with his wife. Dr. Bonds is definitely dedicated to serving others. Possessing numerous accolades, he says, my greatest, my greatest and the ones I am most proud of are, are my belief and faith in mankind. He feels that we all persist in love, respect, and humility for all people. As a testament, his friendly home displayed numerous uh, reading paraphernalia and memorial service awards. He received the Dean Day, Smurf, Dean Day Smith Service to Mankind Award in Bullock County in 1995, the BSA NAACP Essence Award for Distinguished Service in 1995, Appreciation for Dedication to Reading and Literacy in 1993, the fourth annual Black Image Award in, in 1990. As a 47-year member of the original First African Baptist Church, he served as deacon, assistant superintendent, choir member, and Sunday school teacher. He co-founded co his brotherhood ministry and, and food ministry, which is now called Outreach. For 16 years, he served on the Bullock County Board of Education, District 5. He held memberships in Bullock County Historical Society, United Way, Staybook, NAACP, and several other civic organizations. Having written, written black articles, history articles for the States for Herald for three decades, he still oversees the submissions. Dr. Wesley Bond's doctorate, he's a lover of people, a lover of music, and life itself. Thank you, Dr. Bonds, for your long life of commitment to education in Bullock County, our state, and our world. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Call upon the Senator from the 56. Thank you, Mr. President. Last week, my wife and I went out to dinner uh, up in my district, and uh, the restaurant owner, who I know, came over to me, and she said, John, do you know Governor Kemp? I said, well, yes, ma'am, I do. She says, I need you to give him a message. And I said, I'd be glad to. She said, please tell him thank you. I own a restaurant, and I have got friends and family who live in the Northeast. Their restaurants have either been closed, they have lost their life savings, or they will never be able to reopen again, or they're going to be decimated for years to come. That's what they're facing up there. She said, but you know what? In January of this year, I did a couple percent better than I did in January of last year before the pandemic. 
Now, we followed all the rules. We even put some extra heaters out in our porch area. But my folks are working. My business is operating. We're able to take care of all the folks that we care about in our community because Governor Kemp was bold enough and did the right thing to open up our economy safely. So I pass that along to the governor and from me personally, thank you for keeping Georgia safely open for business so our folks could go to work. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. I call upon the Senator for the 42nd. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, colleagues. This morning, something that I regard as unconscionable happened. Controversy mostly imagined regarding voting in the November 3rd presidential election has gripped Georgia and the country over the past three and a half months. Numerous bills regarding voting, many undoing methods of voting that Georgians currently enjoy, have been filed and they have all been sent to the Ethics Committee. Finally, this morning, at the bright and early time of 7 a.m., a few of the bills were presented for a hearing for the first time. Last night, I was on a Zoom with 200 people who planned to tune in to watch their state government at work on this monumental issue that millions are interested in. I myself this morning at seven o'clock opened the legislative website and went to start the live stream when I realized there was no live stream. No way for Georgians to watch their government grapple with this highly significant issue. Many of us received dozens of texts and emails right after 7 a.m. from people who are confused and angry about why they can't watch these controversial bills being discussed. And they are not just texts from voting rights people. They are also from the media, our constituents, and many lobbyists. I was shocked. And why was I shocked? Well, last week I specifically asked during a subcommittee if the subcommittees were live streamed. And the answer was yes. I wanted to make sure, though, so I reached out, my office reached out to Senate Press and to the Office of the Ethics Committee Chairman to inquire about this very thing. Because if I knew they weren't gonna be live streamed, I sure would have made sure that the public still had a way to access the testimony provided this morning. I was not given the courtesy of a response by either of those offices. A sitting senator, no email back about what the plans were with the most controversial hearings, the most controversial bills of this session. This is unacceptable. We are still in the middle of a pandemic. The committee rooms all have a big sign that say there are restrictions on the number of people who can even go in the room. These hearings were at seven o'clock in the morning. I have never seen a hearing at seven o'clock in the morning during my entire tenure as a legislator over the past 10 years. Clearly, we are trying to hide something from the public, the people that we answer to. This gamesmanship is unacceptable. What exactly are we trying to hide? Now we've just called more attention to it by failing to make these, these meetings accessible to the public. There's a scrum of media outside asking all kinds of questions about it. Is that what you really want? Not a good strategy. We are doing the people's work and they are entitled to see what we are up to. Next time, if we don't t intend on live streaming them, I request being told that when I've inquired up front so that I can make sure someone is there who can put these on Facebook Live. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. Call upon the Senator from the 17th. Thank you, Mr. President. 
while we go about our work up here at state capitol there's still a lot of people in our community struggling with COVID-19 and in Henry County our district 3 commissioner Gary Barham has now been at Piedmont Henry for the last week on and off a ventilator not doing very well uh, I want to take a moment if we could and pause for a moment of silence to pray for Commissioner Barham and his family this morning Henry County is doing a virtual prayer vigil at the same time and so I'd ask we can join in a moment of silence and say a prayer for him and his family Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Call upon the Senator from the 39th. Good morning and thank you. Today is the 17th of February, which means it is yet another good day to celebrate Black History Month. Anyone who knows me even just a little bit knows that I'm an art lover and that I am a passionate advocate for the arts. So today I wanted to speak about or maybe even introduce you to an African-American artist named David Driscoll, who is also a son of Georgia. He was born in Eatonton, Georgia in 1931. He traveled the world over during the course of his 70-year career exhibiting throughout the U.S and internationally in England, Holland, South Africa, Poland, Brazil, Japan, and Chile. David Driscoll made art about memory, jazz, cities, spirituality, and nature. He trained as a painter and an art historian, but he worked principally in collage and mixed media. He is cited as one of the world's leading authorities on the subject of African American art. David Driscoll was the recipient of 10 honorary doctoral degrees. He offered seven books on the subject of African American art, and he published more than 40 catalogs from exhibitions that he curated. His articles and essays on African American art have appeared in major publications throughout the world. And in 2000, he was one of 12 people to receive a National Humanities Medal from President Bill Clinton. Here in Atlanta, the David C. Driscoll Prize was established by the High Museum in 2005 as the first national award to honor and celebrate contributions to the field of African American art. David Driscoll passed away just last year at the age of 89. By any measure, he has made a major contribution to American culture through these accomplishments. And if you'll indulge me for just another moment, I'd like to thank the Lieutenant Governor in his office, along with our colleague, the Senator from the 43rd. In honor of Black History Month and together with my office, we put together a small exhibit that is in the rotunda. Um, we have, let's see, it's on view through the end of this week and with assistance from the High Museum and Camille Love from the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs, We've got 11 local up-and-coming or mid-career artists who are represented in the show, and they work in paint, in caustics, mixed media, sculpture, and photography. So if you haven't already, please take a gander through the rotunda and check it out. Thank you. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. Mid-career, that's where they are. I'm, I'm middle-aged, you know, so <laughs> I'm going to live to be 120. <laughs> I heard that, Senator. Senator from 33rd is recognized for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President, my fellow senators, colleagues, and y'all. I just want to remind y'all that today is Ash Wednesday and that if you want to receive ashes, Ron Bigalke is in the back there. He'll be able to help you out. And yes, Rachel, I mean, Senator from the third, I did wash my face this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator from the 24th is recognized for a point of personal privilege. Senator from the second is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Senate, I rise this morning to inform you that Mr. 
Edward Jolly, Jr., former Vice President of Savannah State University, passed this morning. He was Director of Finance. Um, he was an advocate for students. He led Savannah State while he, was president, while he was Vice President of Savannah State for over 12 years. He led them out of a difficult financial situation. He, he was an advocate to rise the student enrollment. And while Vice President of, of Finance, he also was Director of Student Government Relations. And while he was over Student Government Relations and over Government Relations, he was an advocate to make sure that Savannah State got necessary funds while he was Vice President. He leaves three children. He leaves a loving wife. But more importantly, he left a love for not only the Savannah State Institution, but Georgia as a whole, before he loved students, he loved education. I ask that we rise to give tribute for this great man who did so much, not only for Savannah State University, but, but for Georgia. Thank you, Mr. President, I yield the will. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for sharing that uh, news and of uh, your distinguished constituents uh, passing. Call upon the Senator from the seventh. Point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first, I just want to thank the Senator from the 53rd for letting me know that I needed to come speak this morning uh, and uh, giving me that opportunity to do so. Uh, secondly, uh, I did want to take an opportunity, since I am down here this morning, to remind everybody in this body, if, if you remember last year, uh, we passed a bill out of this august body, Senate Bill 211, dealing with meat issues and fake meat and, and the labeling of meat and truth and labeling issues that we have in regards to, to what meat is. And I just found it disturbing yesterday, Mr. President, when I read an article where Bill Gates uh, made comments that we needed to move to synthetic meat, that our nation needed to move in that direction. And I just got one simple comment, Mr. President. I think everybody knows my passion for agriculture and my involvement in agriculture and the livestock and beef and cattle industry. Uh, you know, I would just say that uh, to Mr. Gates that I'm not gonna tell him how to create computer programs or run Microsoft. And I would appreciate it if he left the agriculture industry to those that best understand it. With that, Mr. President, I yield the will. Thank you, Senator. Where's the beef? <laughs> Call upon the senator from the 24th. Is he around? There we go. Call upon the senator from the 24th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. I come to the well first to, to let me get ready, to, uh, welcome our doctor today but first before I say this I'd like to say you know I want to thank each and everybody for trying to be as healthy as possible thank you mr. president for your leadership for everybody wearing masks and it come t this past Tuesday that we had zero test positive and it's awesome so everybody working the great together <laughs> Dr. Day is Bruce McClear, a full professor in the Department of Family Medicine at Augusta University of Georgia. He joined the MCG faculty in 1994 after serving 12 years in the United States Army. He has volunteered his services as a medical director for the MCG medical student-run health care clinic for the homeless. His model has been adopted by a number of other free agencies in the area. In 19, I mean, in 2018, he was honored by the Pro Profession Award for Community Service by the Medical Association of Georgia. If you need to go see Doc, go see him, and just give him a hand. Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator. I'm going to round out the uh, points of personal privilege to uh, remind everyone, if you're not aware, today is National Restaurant, excuse me, State Restaurant Day, uh, February 17. And we've all talked a lot about the pandemic and COVID and the effects this morning. You know, prior to the uh, pandemic, the restaurants were the second largest private employer in the state, employing nearly 500,000 people and generating $25 billion annually. And after this pandemic, 20% of all of our restaurants in Georgia have closed. And in addition to that, over $5 billion has, has been lost. But the restaurant energy, uh, the restaurant energy and the restaurant vitality and the restaurant commitment and their ability to adapt to ever-changing uh, demands has been remarkable. And they're doing, they're doing well. And when you go out to, a, you, you go to, you hear somebody tell you they went to New Orleans or they went to Miami or they went to Chicago or Washington or wherever, they go visit. What do they tell you about when they get back? Well, they tell you about where they ate. And restaurants are an important part of our society, an important part of our, our business, an important part of our economy. So I would encourage you to go on the Georgia Restaurant Association uh, website for their social media and see their posting about what restaurants mean to different people. And we'll honor them uh, today. Uh, with a resolution, uh, the Georgia Restaurant Association. Could y'all give them a big hand because I know they're watching this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senators, before you, you have a uh, consent calendar of privileged resolutions, does any senator wish to remove a resolution from the consent calendar? Hearing none, is there objection to the adoption of the resolutions on the consent calendar? Hearing none, the chair hears none. The resolutions, the consent calendar are thereby adopted. Are there any motions to withdraw or commit? We will now be moving to the rules calendar. Mr. Secretary, would you read Senate Bill 52? Senate Bill 52 by Senator Thompson of the 14th and others. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 1 of Title 10 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to selling and other trade practices so as to provide for legislative findings, provide standards for cybersecurity programs to protect businesses from liability, to provide for affirmative defenses for data breaches of private information, and for other purposes. Mr. President, on February 8, 2021, the Senate Committee on Science and Technology recommends that this bill do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Dolezal of the 27th District Chair. The Senate Committee on Science and Technology offer the following substitute to Senate Bill 52. A bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 1 of Title 10 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to selling and other trade practices so as to provide for legislative findings, to provide standards for cybersecurity programs, to protect businesses from liability, to provide for affirmative action, to, pr to provide for affirmative defenses for data breaches of private information, to provide for related matters, to provide for effective date, to repeal conflicting laws, and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Call upon the Senator from the 14th to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. As we talk about what the impact COVID has had on businesses in our state and around the country, it's been a relatively short term if we talk about that. It happened, and it's happened in the last 12 to 14 months. But something that's been ravaging our businesses for a number of years, and during COVID, only increased, and that is cybersecurity data breaches. I bring before you this morning Senate Bill 52, the Data Protection Act. We addressed this over the last two years. In fact, last year we brought Senate Bill 493 that this body deliberated and voted 30 to 18 and sent it over to the House. We just ran out of time. What this bill does is this. Currently, if we find ourselves in a posture where cybersecurity helps businesses protect against costly data breaches, but just as important, cyber protections against the citizens from expensive and harmful cause by having their personal and financial information compromised. 
This Data Protection Act encourages businesses to achieve the gold standard of cybersecurity by incentivizing businesses to defend themselves and their customers against ever-changing cyber threats. Within this bill, we seek to open up Title 10 and add a section to it. And what that does is it establishes the opportunity that we would be able to have a safe harbor. In other words, provisions within it that businesses would comply with in the event that they find themselves with a data breach, that there could be an affirmative defense in court. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a pro-business bill. It's a bill that's bipartisan. It's to be able to protect the businesses that are out there that are struggling from COVID, but continue to be able to be hit, or continue to be hit by the impact of cybersecurity. On that note, let's just talk for a second about why this is so important. Just to this statistics right now, seen a 300% increase in cyber attacks during the COVID-19 pandemic. On average, on average, every 39 seconds, 39 seconds, we have a cyber attack. 43% of cyber attacks attack small businesses. 150 million is the average cost of a data breach. Think about these businesses back in your communities that are struggling. Can they handle a $150 million attack? Data suggests that cybercrime costs businesses over $2 trillion. Data breaches exposed 4.1 billion records in the first six months. As of 2019, cyber attacks are considered among the top five risks globally. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to hear some people say that we're creating an environment that's going to honor or protect bad actors. That is farthest thing from the truth. Let's keep in mind what's happening here. It's the bad actors, mostly foreign, that are doing these things, that are hacking. We're not seeking to protect the bad actors. What we're trying to do is protect the businesses that are being hacked by the bad actors. Mr. President, I'll stop there, and I'll yield well if there are no questions. You have a question. Uh, senator from the 6th. I suspect. You're recognized for a question. Will the senator yield? I will. With respect to line 31, the defined term covered entity, and I just have a really quick question. With respect to a covered entity in terms of this bill, would Amazon <coughs> be a covered entity? Senator, again, this is not defined in this bill that we would set this up for that. So uh, I understand your question and I appreciate your question, but that hasn't been defined whether or not they would be covered or not. Well, and I'm asking you, they, they would be covered, the, correct? Well, again, that would be defined once we set this, establish this up and then dis define whether or not they would qualify or not. And isn't it true, Senator, that Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft would all be covered entities under this bill? Well, Senator knows what she speaks, but again, we're just trying to establish the environment that we can pre protect these small businesses if they're complying by some standards. And with respect to Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft, do you consider them small businesses that are struggling? Uh, I would consider them large businesses, but I certainly can't quantify or determine whether or not they're struggling. Do you continue to yield? I will. Chair recognizes the minority whip for a question. Thank you. Will the Senator yield? I will. I have um, a question looking at page one, heading to page two, lines 14. Where it's affirmative defense to any cause of action sounding in tort, why would it not also be an affirmative defense to any cause of action in, in contract? I'm sorry. Can you restate the question? I can't Okay, so it's an affirmative defense to any cause of action sounding in tort. That's on page two, line 14. Would that, why would it also not be any affirmative defense to an action sounding in contract? Well, Senator, I'm certainly open that we can uh, amend that if you'd like to be able to cover that when we move over to the House on this. Okay. And I have one, Senator Further Yell. I will. And I'm just looking for explanation under no, line 16 where it has any regulatory enforcement. What, what does that part mean when we're saying any uh, regulatory what? enforcement? Sorry. From what I understand that any regulatory enforcement proceeding brought under the laws of the state or in the court. In other words, if it's a regulatory bo body and they're actually complying, we're trying to include that in there. So that's my understanding for that. Okay, thank you, Senator. 
Chair recognizes the senator from the 40th for a question. Will the gentleman yield? I will. So if the state contracted with a private vendor, say to process absentee ballots, and as a part of that process, uh, had access to private information such as driver's licenses and other private identifying information. And they had some sort of contract to, for cybersecurity, but there was a breach of that data. Would this protect that company in terms of liability from that breach? Senator, I appreciate your concern about voting and privacy, and I think that um, this body, as well as the body across the hall, are trying to make sure that we protect that data. This specifically is not trying to address that, but I think there are plenty of opportunities we're going to see to be able to protect the data when it comes to voting in the future. You have no more questions. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate your favorable consideration. Chair recognizes the senator from the 6th to speak to Senate Bill 52. Thank you, Mr. President. This past election cycle and even beyond to, to today, I have heard from so many Republican that something needs to be done about big tech. Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft. I've listened to argument after argument that the impact of big tech censorship, that their censorship somehow impacted the result of the election in November. I have heard that big tech has a bias against conservatives and Christians. There was even an assertion at the now infamous Giuliani Senate hearings that money from big tech billionaires that made its way to local boards of election somehow impacted the election and threw it for President Biden. And along with those concerns, we have seen at the national level, at the federal level, that Republicans have taken up the cause of repealing Section 230. And for those of you who don't know, Section 230 is a federal law that provides immunity to big tech from liability for certain causes of action. So I am struggling today to understand why if there are such significant concerns with respect to these businesses, what they do, their practices, um, that somehow we're going to go even further and offer them immunity at the state level as well. It's a bad thing for consumers. It does not incentivize businesses to do the right thing. And frankly, it's absolutely inconsistent with a lot of the positions that many in this room have taken previously. I yield the well. Chair recognizes the minority whip to speak to Senate Bill 52. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be brief. Um, when describing this bill as being pro-business, that's exactly what it is, but it's not necessarily pro our, our citizens. And the reason why I ask that question about sounding in tort and not in contract is because what this bill basically is is that we understand it. It's the, we know that things are going to happen, Bill. In other words, there's going to be data breaches. So we're, we're acknowledging that. And so what we're doing is we're giving affirmative defense in tort which basically would apply more so to your private citizens. The contract aspect of it and why that la language is not there is also not in any other particular bill that also mirrors this is because businesses are like, yeah, we know everything's gonna happen, but if we have a data breach and we have a contract saying that you're gonna protect our information, we're not giving you that affirmative defense. So it is a, it's a great business bill, but what we ought to have in here is language that says that any cause of action sounded in tort or in contract, because at that point in time, we're including everybody. What we're doing now is just really including our private citizens. Also, this bill does something different. It really basically mirrors uh, Ohio, which was the 
state that actually started this whole process off. And we basically have similar language. But I also would point out in the Ohio law, it does not include regulatory enforcement. It only includes tort actions in tort. So our law actually goes even further. So not only are we doing actions in tort, not contract, so we're only harming our citizens, not business, but we're also saying that we're giving affirmative defense if you breach where there's any type of regulatory enforcement. So even though we're following Ohio, which was, I think, the first state to do this, they even said, we, we, we don't need to do that. The only thing that we're going to do is just do actions in tort. They left out regulatory enforcement. That's a big deal to actually say that you would have an affirmative defense towards any regulatory action. Another thing that we're missing in this particular bill, because it follows the Ohio legislation, but the Ohio legislation actually goes further and actually tells us where we should look to as far as our framework is concerned. And they give our similar language about protecting data and doing things which are reasonable in the, in the industry. But they also say that you're going to basically have to, you'll be deemed to protect data if you follow the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And they have that and they also have various other institutes that you have to follow. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, the code section that they're citing, is 55 pages long. That's the framework that you have to follow in Ohio. So we've given much less um, rights to our citizens here. It definitely is a pro-business bill, and it's just very concerning that we leave our citizens hanging, but we won't, do, we won't do this for businesses. And that's why I'm against this bill, Mr. President, and I yield the well. Senator has yielded the well. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? The chair sees none. The chair recognizes the senator from the 14th to close debate. Thank you, Mr. President. I find it interesting that this body is so focused on trying to make sure we're protecting our citizens during COVID. We all agreed on that. We take an issue like this that is affecting the businesses in our community, businesses that are bipartisan, and we try and politicize it with something that has nothing to do with what this bill is. It's true that we can say that other states we're modeling it after. In fact, we're not. We're actually modeling it after New York. And frankly, we have something that is unique to our state in some ways. And the utilization of various frameworks that the Senator referenced to, like NIS and ISO, it violates our non-delegation principle that's laid out in the Georgia Constitution, of which he's aware of. Mr. President, members of the Senate, I ask your favorable consideration for this bill. As we set aside our other discussions that we have here or in caucus and other way, other places, to come together and say, we are going to protect not only the businesses and the citizens of our state against foreign actors, and we're going to send a message saying that if these businesses comply and these businesses commit to be able to protect these people, that we're going to stand behind these businesses which employ the citizens of our state. With that, Mr. President, I ask for a favorable consideration. The question is on the adoption of the committee substitute. Is there objection to adoption of the committee substitute? Chair hears none, and the committee substitute is adopted. Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none, the report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? The chair hears none, and the main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill? All those in favor vote yay, opposed nay. The secretary will unlock the machine. Have all senators voted? Have all senators voted? Always look clear. Mr. Secretary, please close the machine.
On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 31, the nays are 18. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed by substitute. Mr. Secretary, please read the caption of Senate Bill 81. Senate Bill 81 by Senator Melissa the 53rd and others. Bill to be entitled an act to amend code section 20-4-37 of the official code of Georgia annotated relating to the office of college and career transitions and powers and duties so as to change the name of the office of college and career transitions to the office of the college and career academies. To provide for increased technical skills to provide for collaboration between the technical college system of Georgia and for other purposes. That completes the order Mr. President. Chair recognizes the rules, Chairman, to present Senate Bill 81. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, now looky here. I've got an easy bill for you, Senator from the 15th. I've got a logical bill here for you, Senator from the 3rd. As Spock would say, this is going to be an easy moment for us today. In a world of controversy, this is not. The Senate passed this bill last year. It was Senate Bill 416 unanimously. That means everybody except you new folks. And today you can show that it again will be unanimous by 55 to, to 0. What does this bill do? Very simple. The Office of College and Career Transition will be changed to what it is, the Office of College and Career Academies. Right now, as you know, there are 52 of these academies across the state. And every one of you that have one in your district, you know that's a, a different tool in the toolbox to prepare our students for uh, technology type jobs, to make them ready so that we can help recruit business in the industry, to help our existing industries grow. That's what this bill does, to help our communities with employment. This also does one other thing. And I'd like to thank the, uh, the chair of higher ed for helping me with this last year and this year. This bill will also ensure collaboration with the workforce development boards in your area and the state, with the Department of Economic Development, with other college and career academies to make sure that workforce is our priority to make sure, again, that we help recruit business and industries, not only to the state, but to our, to our communities. To also help, which I think is even more importantly, our existing industries grow. So Mr. President, with this simple bill, and this bill that I appreciate your support, if there are any questions, I would be delighted. Chair recognizes answer. the Senator from the 52nd. Thank you, Mr. President. Would the uh, great senator from Chickamauga yield? I will yield to the senator of Georgia's Rome. With uh, this name change a while back to transition, was this to make it sound like a halfway house or a day prison? Or well, that's some of my concern, so that we know exactly what it stands for. And um, is it not true that in 2008, the first year that there was a college and career academy, that it was established in my home county of Floyd? That's why uh, you have a lot of superiors coming from your district, and let me commend you on that, leading the way, as you have in the Georgia's Rome. And even just a few years ago, of the 56 districts there, that 25% of the college and career academies were from my district. You might call us the Mesopotamia of college and career academies. Is that not true? Well, I've heard that, and I think that's a good definition. Well, I certainly support your bill and appreciate your work on this. Thank you, Senator. I mean, that was kind of funny. Do you As continue senator, to yield for more? Of course, Mr. President. I would be delighted. You have no questions. All right. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate your vote. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against Senate Bill 81? The chair sees none. Is there objection or agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? The chair hears none and the main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill. All those in favor of the bill vote yay. Oppose nay. The secretary will unlock the machine.
Have all senators voted? Have all senators voted? Mr. Secretary, please close the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 51, the nays are zero. This bill having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, can you please read the caption of Senate Bill 88? Senate Bill 88 by Senator Goodman of the 8th District. Bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 2 of Title 20 of the OCGA relating to elementary and secondary education so as to provide that the Georgia Teacher of the Year shall be invited to serve as an advisor to ex officio to the State Board of Education to provide for non-traditional teacher certification program for members and veterans of the United States Armed Forces and for other purposes. Mr. President, on February 10th, 2021, the Senate Committee on Education and Youth recommends that this bill do pass, respectfully submitted to Senator Payne of the 54th District Chair. That completes the order, Mr. President. Before the chair recognizes the senator from the 8th, uh, he knows it's his first time to present a bill in the well. Uh, the rules, specifically 8-1.7, Eight dash one dot seven provide for a generous allotment of time to present your bill. They allow for thirty minutes for you to present the bill, but I will urge you as a first time presenter in the well to leave a little bit of time for some questions. Chair recognizes the senator from the eighth to present Senate Bill eighty eight. Thought y'all were seeing who was taller. <laughs> oh, Lordy. It is an honor to be before all of you today. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, has my distinguished colleague and fraternity brother from the seventh. Uh, I'm also in the cattle business, and uh, I know the the look that uh, the cow gives you sometimes when you have to get loaded on a trailer to go. And I feel like that cow. So, at any rate, uh, today it's my honor to bring uh, to the floor <laughs> the, the the governor's teacher pipeline bill. Uh, as the husband of a third generation public uh, school teacher. A uh, family member of a veteran and advocate for education in rural Georgia, I'm honored to bring this piece of legislation forward on behalf of the governor. Since day one, the governor has been a champion for education and specifically our teachers. His teacher pipeline initiative focuses on recruiting, preparing, mentoring, and retaining Georgia's talented teachers. Today I bring Senate Bill 88 before. Uh, this bill highlights the commitment we all have to improve the lives of our teachers and preserve the teaching profession. This bill has six parts that focus on recruiting, preparing, mentoring, and retaining Georgia's teachers. First, this bill allows the Georgia Teacher of the Year to serve as the advisor ex officio to the State Board of Education. Teachers' voices should be part of the decision-making process at the state level, and it's important to link the State Board of Education directly to Georgia's classrooms and teachers. Secondly, Senate Bill 88 supports a pathway for Armed Force veterans to become alternatively certified teachers. In Georgia, we have a surplus of veterans due to our military bases, and many veterans leave the service looking for jobs or ways to contribute to society. This legislation will support and enhance the existing pathway for veterans who meet minimum degree and testing requirements to become certified teachers in Georgia. Third, this bill ensures utilization of excess observational resources to new teachers or teachers who need support. Teachers who have proven excellence in the classroom do not require as many observations as new teachers or teachers who receive needs development or ineffective. This legislation ensures observational supports are rerouted to coach and mentor new teachers or teachers who need support. Uh, fourth, this, this bill also improves differentiated instruction for future teachers. After reviewing surveys from new teachers and their employers, we see a gap in teacher preparedness and differentiated instruction for at-risk students. English language learners, students with disabilities, and gifted students. 
It is pivotal that new teachers heading to the classroom are equipped with strategies to reach all students at varying instructional levels. Part five of the bill improves reading instruction for future teachers. Future teachers must learn the skills and strategies needed to be able to teach the fundamental skills of reading. This includes phonomic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, reading comprehension, and any other essential instruction and curriculum concepts deemed necessary for reading instructions in the classroom. And finally, this bill also enhances the, our historical black college and university's role in teacher preparation programs. HBCUs play a significant role in teacher preparation. This legislation will ensure that the Georgia Professional Standards Commission will work with HBCUs to lead the charge to create innovative ways to get more minority teachers in our classrooms. This six-part bill will improve the lives of our students, teachers, and administrators. And with that, Mr. President, I'd be glad to take questions. I don't think I've ever seen a group of skillful legislators quite this big that have questions. I'm going to start with our fearless rules chairman. Recognize the rules chairman for a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Does the senator yield? Yes, sir. Would you explain to me why you were picked to present this outstanding bill? Why was it you? Uh, Senator, I think it's because of my great oratory. I'm not for sure, though. I would uh, not agree with that. <laughs> would the Blueberry Senator yield for another question? Yes, sir. You know, this is an important bill for our educators, mm -hmm. for our students. Mm -hmm. So you have graduated high school, correct? Mm -hmm. College, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, some people, when they graduate college, it's cum laude. But in your case, was it, is it not true that you were, you graduated Laudy How Come? <laughs> yes, sir, that is indeed true. Okay. Would the center of a bellowing cow yield? Yes, sir. Do you realize this is your new nickname? <laughs> we're going to establish it here? Yes, sir, I'm honored. Uh, Senator, let me commend you on this bill, and I'd be honored to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Chair Thank recognizes you. the Senator from the 7th for a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, my uh, distinguished fraternity brother will, will de de determine how you do today. We may, <laughs> we may have to reconsider that. But will you yield? Yes, sir. Be honored to. Good deal. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I honestly don't know what it is about the Senators from the 8th and cows around here, but... Uh, your predecessor left you with a uh, distinctive uh, love, uh, apparently. But uh, can you can you tell this body who the uh, since we're talking about the teacher of the year, mm -hmm. can you tell us who the current teacher of the year is? Miss Tracy Penley. Good deal. He le he learned something yesterday in rules. I, I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, it, it, would you further yield? Yes, sir. Can you let us know who your teacher of the year in your local school district is? Um, the senator so speaks. Oh, what? <laughs> so, if if I understand this right, uh, you, you um, senator, I, you don't even know who the teacher of the year that went up to be vying for the state school teacher of the year is. That we we're gonna have to work on your knowledge of your your district. Um, with that said, in, in line in your bill dealing with the teacher of the year in lines 32 and 33, it says that the teacher of the year will be entitled to receive a sum provided for by code section 45-7-21. What sum is that? How much money will that individual be paid? Do you know? What, what's the teacher you're gonna be yeah, compensated? So, yeah, it's, it's saying it's, they're gonna be compensated a sum of money based on code section 45-7-21. Do you know what that? It's per diem, I believe. Oh, it's per diem. Okay, all right, good deal. I, I think you're all right because we want to make sure we know how much money we're expending. Uh, you know, and, and, and the last question, do you know, um, I, I can't find the effective date in here anywhere. When will this go into effect? July 1. July 1. Hi, he's, he's doing pretty good. Well, that, Mr. President, <laughs> I have no more questions. Thank almost, you. You almost had a pretty smart does, fraternity. Does, does, the, does the senator uh, yield? Sir, that's not uh, the way. That ain't how this works. <laughs> that's not the way this works. <laughs> Chair recognizes the senator from the Brace for Impact 28.
does the senator yield? Yes, sir. Senator, you're answering some pretty tough questions up there. You seem pretty smart. Um, I want to refer you to lines 47. It says, holds a bachelor degree or higher with a grade point average equal to or above a minimum established by the Professional Standards Commission. Mm -hmm. My first question, Senator, is what is that minimum? The, the minimum uh, GPA. What is the minimum GPA? You're smart. You should know it. Uh, hmm. The senator so speaks. Do you, do you yield? Yes, sir, I do. The fact that you don't know that is fine, and I'll forgive you if you'll just answer me this. Yes, sir. What was your GPA? Well, let me just say this, Senator. Uh, George W. Bush was President of the United States, so I'm further proof that a C student can be a state senator as well. Well, is it not true that a D student can be as well? <laughs> I, no, sir. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, uh, no, no, sir. That's, I, I'm sure it's possible, yes. Sir, do you continue to yield? Yes, sir, absolutely. Chair recognizes the senator from the second for a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, do yes, you yield? My question is on lines 176 to 179. When it talks about historical black colleges and universities, mm -hmm. does this mention of this, does that come with any, any appropriations? 167. On line 167, you said? 176. Through 176. Uh, 176, okay. Uh -huh. I do not believe it does, sir. You mentioned this bill, sir. It talks about innovative programs mm -hmm. and the need for historical black colleges, how important they are. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you also agree that it should come with some appropriations if you think this is a great need, sir? Uh, I think the senator knows what he speaks. Yes, sir. You, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you continue to yield? Uh, yes, sir. And you must have made quite an impact in your caucus already. Chair recognizes <laughs> the senator from the 18th for a question. Thank you, Mr. President. Does the senator yield? Yes, sir. Senator, you, um, as I recall, the last time you were in the well, you told us a very detailed, moving, personal story of family members. In fact, to many of us, it seems like that story just ended moments ago. But I want to ask you now a little bit about your, your, your bill. So this is about the teacher of the year, right? Mm -hmm. And would you tell, the, uh, tell this body what, what profession your wife is in? She's a, she's a third generation public school teacher. Okay. And would it be so, Senator, that would your wife be eligible to be teacher of the year? Yes, sir, I believe she would. Do you think your wife, Senator, would be qualified to be teacher of the year? Absolutely. And Senator, if you would continue to yield, would you in fact support any efforts so that your wife could be and attain the Teacher of the Year designation? Yes, sir. So Senator, my question really is based on the last time you were here and, the base time, and based on your bill today is, are you going to present any bills to this body that aren't fraught with personal conflicts and all for personal gain? Senator, I would only say that the senator from the seventh knows my wife, and uh, he would tell you that. Uh, um, Go ahead and finish your sentence. Uh, you, you, senator, you might just want to let it lay right there <laughs> where it is. Thank you. I do support your bill. Thank you, sir. Chair recognizes the minority leader for a question. Would the senator yield? Yes, ma'am. Senator, have you ever heard of if common sense was common, that everybody would have some? Yes, ma'am, I have. Senator, further yield? Yes, ma'am. Don't you think it's about time common sense take precedence of all of this? <laughs> yes, ma'am, I believe it does. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. 
Do, with, you, con do you continue to yield? I think with that, I will uh, yield. Thank you very much. The senator has yielded the well. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? That would have triggered another 20 minutes for you to close debate. Chair hears none. Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Is there object objection to the main question being ordered? The chair hears none. The main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill? All those in favor of the bill will vote yay. Opposed nay. The secretary will unlock the machine. Have all senators voted? Have all senators voted? Hallways clear. Mr. Secretary, please close the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 50, the nays are zero. This bill, having received the requisite count troops majority, is therefore passed. Congratulations, Senator. We're all going to be 24 minutes ahead of schedule today. Chair recognizes the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate stand adjourned until 10 o'clock on Thursday, February 18th, 2021. Mr. Secretary, can you please read the announcements? The Committee on Rules will meet. Upon adjournment in 450 of the Capitol, Committee on Urban Affairs will meet at 12 p.m. and 125 of the Capitol. Committee on Health and Human Services will meet at 1 p.m. and 450. Committee on Natural Resources and Environment will meet at 1 p.m. and 307 at CLOB. The Committee on Education and Youth will meet at 12 at 2:15 and 307 at CLOB. The Committee on Retirement will meet at 2:15 and 450 of the Capitol. The Committee on Finance will meet at 3:30. 450 of the Capitol, the Committee on Insurance and Labor, the Subcommittee on Health and Workmen's Compensation will meet in Mezzanine 1 at 4 p.m., and the Committee on Judiciary will meet at 4.45 p.m. and 3.07 of CLOB. That completes the order, Mr. President. Do any senators wish to make an announcement? The Chair sees none. The Majority Leader has moved that the Senate stand adjourned until Thursday, February 18, 2021, at 10 a.m. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Opposed, no. no. The ayes clearly have it, and the Senate will stand adjourned.